Great. So just 15 minutes in the session, we can start. I hope you, I, I hope you enjoyed our. Uh, <laughs> yeah, alpha. Yeah, you are you are alpha testers. Thanks for that. Thanks for helping us doing this. Okay, so uh, this session is actually a continuation of the last year's session, uh, which is the introduction to time synchronization. Uh, this part will be a bit more practical. So this will be the uh, how do you turn it on uh, session. However, since turning it on takes only a couple minutes, I had to invent like 30 more, more slides to fill in the slot. Uh, so you will have to bear with me through the a bit of theory, a bit of like what happened previously and so on. So let's start. So the first question that you probably had is what's in it for me why would i go and listen to this guy again uh, so basically the reason we want to get better timing uh, and and run the ptp is when we want to synchronize time with sub microsecond precision uh, because technically if you if you're okay with microseconds then probably you can also use ntp However, PTP is a step forward in this, on this path. Uh, it provides with uh, administration free operation. So it implements the um, best master algorithm, which can automatically select which one, uh, which, which master you will choose and which one will give you time. Um, you can, uh, thanks for to, to uh, synchronized time, you can synchronize events on multiple platforms when you want to do something across different uh, servers. You can basically scale things up when you have the same time on, on the platforms. Uh, so it can give you better monitoring and telemetry. Obviously, you know, if you, if you uh, are in the same time scale and, and at the same like uh, point in time you can you can monitor things better you can actually understand what happens beyond just your single platform but you can scale it up it can also give you better distributed databases because of the scalability issues you can't really run that big databases on just a single platform and if you use the the ptp to to actually synchronize time it can give you some advantages where you can just set for example some queries to expire at some time or or give some uh, windows when when you wait for the updates and then do your stuff it can also provide with a better cryptography so basically you can you can expire uh, your keys at certain point in time you can measure latency between the nodes if you are synchronized and probably your hardware supports it anyway so there is no extra hidden cost of deploying it <clears throat> so a short agenda <laughs> yep huh. it can't work okay let's try sharing again And let's hope it will work this time. Yeah, should work. Okay, so so first we will do a short uh, reminder, short short recap from of what happened on the previous NetDev. And then we will talk about time in Linux. I will probably try to compress that part because we are a bit ahead of a schedule. Then I'll introduce the Linux PTP, which is the main synchronization framework for Linux. Uh, then we will talk about putting it all together and introduce some tips and tricks about, about how to deploy it and what are the common pitfalls. So in the previous episode, on the previous NetDev, <laughs> uh, we introduced the PTP, which is the two-way timing protocol that's a bit alike NTP, but it's better. 
and functions, but by sending timestamps uh, from source of time, which is called the master, to the receiver of a time or a client, which is called a slave. Uh, it's, it, it involves, it's described as IEEE 1588 standard. It's kind of a super set of possibilities which you can pick and choose from. Uh, it can synchronize time to sub microsecond accuracy. Actually, if you implement the white rabbit protocol over it, you can even go sub nanoseconds if you want to. <clears throat> it uses the hierarchical master slave architecture for clock distribution and provides administration free operation to a degree. And uh, it's applicable for high-end devices and low-end devices. You can actually deploy the time server even on Raspberry Pi if you can buy one. <clears throat> actually, if you're in Europe, you can buy one because there is a store which sells them and have them in stock. Uh, OK, so how this works in the theory. So the frequency and time transfer starts with the uh, leader or the or the master of time, which actually is usually connected to some external source of time. Uh, this part is uh, functions in like this. This part needs to somehow code the packets from the physical reference. So it usually uses, for example, the GNSS receiver, which provides the one pulse per second signal as the physical reference of time. Plus, it gives the time of the information which tells you what time really it is. Uh, and it encodes that in some kind of packets. Then the transfer over the network happens and the follower side uh, actually regenerates the physical frequency and uh, the time from the received packets. So I'll skip through that how it works. The important part here is that there are uh, messages that are time critical, those are the sync message uh, that's sent from the leader to the follower or from master to slave and the delay request. Other are not time critical, so if they are delivered late or, or somehow cached, it's not a big tragedy to obviously not for too long, but, but if it's only delayed a bit, then it's not a problem. So a bit about the time in Linux. <clears throat> so what we actually have um, is it all starts with the hardware on the bottom, uh, on the hardware layer, uh, we have our network interface card. It usually has some way of timestamping packets uh, and physical signals. So you have some hardware pins that, that you can connect, for example, your physical one pulse per second uh, to deliver the, the reference of time. Uh, and it uh, can timestamp the packets that come in and out to the NIC. So then it has the uh, PTP hardware clock. So it has some kind of uh, clock embedded inside the, the uh, chip that is actually counting or measuring the time. And then everything is obviously exposed through the PCI or, e or any other bus. Uh, and inside the kernel, uh, you have the driver that exposes obviously the data path in the, to the network stack, but it also exposes the PTP clock uh, inside the dev PTP uh, as the, as the uh, POSIX clock device. And uh, that everything is exposed to the user space uh, using sockets for the network stack and the IOCTLs to this PTP clock. Uh, that controls this uh, block, the, the PTP hardware clock inside the NIC. So on top in the user space, we run the Linux PTP uh, suite that that's contains a couple of useful tools for, for dealing with time. So if it comes to the POSIX clocks API, uh, like I said, they are represented as POSIX clocks. Uh, they can give, they expose the API that, that enables you to adjust time in form of adjusting the frequency of the clock and adjusting the time as the phase of the clock. And obviously it gives you the reasons to, to get the time and set the time, obviously. Okay, so how to find out uh, 
if your hardware supports the time stamping and the, all the all the goodness that that makes PTP so good, uh, you need to run the if tool with the capital dash uh, dash capital T and the interface number, and this will give you the information about the time stamping parameters of a given device. And what you need to look for is those uh, marked lines, which gives you the information that your hardware supports hardware. Uh, offloading of the time stamping uh, for the transmit receive packets and if if it does the precision is far better than if you just use the software implementation obviously okay i'll skip those because we don't really have time but there is a sysfs interface that uh, allows you to to play with the clock it's exposed in the sysclass ptp uh, path and it gives you the uh, it gives you the ability to actually set the hardware pins that uh, that can be useful for for like getting the time. But since we are significantly beyond ahead of, I'll, I'll just skip through this. Okay, so the, let's introduce the Linux PTP. Uh, project is the 1588 Swiss Army knife. It contains all the tools that are actually very useful for for synchronizing time and transferring it through the network. So the main tool is the PTP4L. Uh, this one is used for to to synchronize uh, time between the network interfaces. Uh, so you will run it if you want to to run your uh, master and slave ports. Then there is a TS2PHC. Uh, this tool is used for synchronizing the time inside your NIC to the external timestamp signals, for example, the one from the GNSS. Uh, and then there is a PHC to Sys. Uh, that's the tool that can either synchronize two clocks between them using software path, uh, or synchronize the system time to the time from your network uh, clock. And additionally, there are a couple helpful tools. That's the PMC. This is the PTP management clients. This is the tool that you can run to either get the data set or set the data set inside your PTP4L that's running. And it's very useful if you want to either get some information or reconfigure your clocks. And also there is a very useful service or, or a, how to say the tool that, that actually Packs PTP4L together with the PHC to Sys. Uh, that's called Time Master, and the Time Master uh, uses also the uh, either the ChronID or NTPD, and can allow you to set up the PTP as one of the NTP sources. So you can actually deploy the system that will use the NTP, but it will get time from the PTP and provide it to the NTP subsystem. So it it is kind of a bridge between two worlds. So if you if you want to experiment, you can, for example, set up some nodes to get the time from the PTP and then give it to, to other nodes that are not so critical over the NTP. <clears throat> OK, so now let's try to start our first PTP4L. Uh, to do that, we uh, obviously need to give it the network interface name. Then we will use the dash M so that the, the output is printed on the standard output in, instead of syslog. And let's assume we now encode everything in the in our magical files. But you can, even if you skip this part, it will work because it will just use the default config. And you can use the dash S on the client side so that it never enters the master state. So it won't start to provide, for example, incorrect time if it cannot uh, find the other master inside the network. So uh, if we start with the server side, it will actually, oh, the slides are gone again. Or... OK, the timeout. <laughs> can see the yeah they can okay great let's then try to continue uh okay so once you uh, start the server configure obviously the config file uh, to to configure the data set that it will uh, send to to the to the network 
uh, you will actually uh, need to pay attention to those lines, uh, which which are telling the that we are the ground master. So it will select the local clock as the best master and then start sending the announced messages and all other PTP messages downstream. Okay, then when we go to the client side, uh, it will behave differently. It will first initialize, obviously, then it will uh, try to find the server, so it will listen for the announced messages sent by the masters. And once it is, finds the best master, it will choose it and it will start synchronizing to the PHC to, to, the, to the, the, the time sent by this master. And what the fields actually mean? Uh, this is the basic, uh, the most basic setup that you will see when you just start the tool. If you because uh, if you send more messages than reports, then it will average the results and the results will look a bit differently, but the columns will be basically the same, just just a bit. It will give you more de details about the uh, average and RMS uh, of, the, of the corrections. So the first column is the offset uh, between, the, between our clock and the server clock. Uh, the second uh, column will give you the state. So the state at zero means that uh, there is no uh, log between two clocks. S1 means that we found the clock, but we need a big step to correct the time. And S2 is, is when we logged the, uh, our clock to the server clock. And the slides are from again. There is some Wi-Fi problem here. Wi-Fi is that good? Yeah. No, I oh, think we will. Think really... Yeah, but basically the S2 state means that we are we are only correcting the frequency, not the phase of the clock, which is kinda important because in Sometimes need the continuity, the, the, the clock ticks to be monotonous, and if you change the phase, it can actually do the rapid jump in time, so that may sometimes make some applications not happy. Uh, the third column is giving you the frequency difference. Uh, because the magic of PTP, as opposed especially to the SNTP, is that it also corrects the frequency, so your clock will also tick at the same rate as the master clock, not only uh, synchronize the phase, then tick at different rate, and then synchronize phase all over again. And the last column is the calculated delay of the path, the average delay between the master and the slave. So the next tool is the TS2PHC. Uh, as I mentioned, this is the tool that you will run if you if you actually want to synchronize the, your clock inside your network interface to the external time stop signals. So, for example, the PPS signal from the GNSS falls into that category. Uh, so, if you want to do that, you need to give it the config file, which can contain some specifics for for a given hardware. Uh, you need to give it the source of the time of day information. Uh, so you can pick between the generic source, which is your system timer. There is a card there, which I will hopefully manage to mention later. Uh, there is, you can pick the, another uh, PHC clock. So for example, you can, you can put the time cards uh, that, that is synchronized to the, to the GNSS already and use that as the time of day information for the other network cards. And you can put the NMEA, which will parse the NMEA messages sent from the, from the GNSS receiver. <clears throat> then obviously we want the messages on the standard output, so we will give the dash M. And the dash C specifies the sync clock uh, to be synchronized. You can actually specify it multiple times, so one time of uh, time of day data can be used for multiple adapters at the same time. And last but not least, the PHC to Sys, uh, which can 
either synchronize uh, the clock real time, which is the special uh, clock uh, inside the system, the special because it can be read very fast. There are special operations in both Intel and ARM architecture uh, that actually are specialized to read uh, to, to return the clock time uh, of the, sy the system time uh, very fast. Like in, if you compare the time of pulling the time from your network adapter and the system time, uh, getting time from the network adapter takes around one microsecond, and getting it from the system time gets uh, returns in about 20 nanoseconds. So that's really different. So if you want to synchronize your system timer to the time from the adapter, you need to specify dash s as the server, like the source of time uh, to your device, then dash c uh, clock real time, which will synchronize the system time. Uh, dash W will wait for the PTP4L to get into the synchronized state, and Dash M will print the messages to the standard output. Uh, the other choices you have is to use the dash capital O and the offset in nanosecond uh, in uh, seconds between the uh, clocks. Uh, so then the the PHC2Sys will immediately start synchronizing clocks, not wait for any PTP4L states. And also, you can use the dash A dash R, which will be completely automatic uh, mode, which will basically uh, talk to the PTP4L, wait until it's in the sync state, uh, get the port that it's synced to, uh, and pull the time from it and synchronize system time to it. Uh, and if you use the give the dash R twice, it will also allow the uh, PTP4L that's the mast in the master state to be the source of time. If you don't, if you specify it only once, it will only pull the time from the slaves. And the slides are gone again, or? <laughs> yeah. Okay, so I will quickly breeze through the PHC to sys output because it's basically the same as PTP4L. So, yeah. No. Okay, so the uh, other tool that I would like to introduce is the PMC. Uh, this tool is very useful if you want to get, for example, the data set from the from your port. Uh, or the statistics of your port. So uh, it's it, it can actually get the parameter as the dash u, which will use the local UDS port. So whenever the PTP4L starts, it will actually uh, create the UDS socket uh, that will that will enable you to communicate to to the PTP4L that's running. Uh, dash b will give you only the local port stuff. If you if you uh, Set it to one; it will go deeper down the chain, so it will also give you the data set of the of your master that you're synchronized to. And then you need to give the command. For example, this one will it will pull the statistics of the port. And in the end, like, there is a time master uh, which actually uses ptp 4 and phc 2 sys to create the uh, to combine them with the chronity and NTPD and we'll synchronize clock to NTP and PTP sources. We'll actually try to find the best source in your network. It may be that NTP that's, for example, you, you may have the better NTP connectivity, so it will go that route, but if not, it will select the PTP uh, clock for the best source. And also, there is one more tool in, the, in this tool set. Uh, it's the PHCCTL. It's a simple tool that can control some parameters of the PHC, so the hardware clock inside your network or, or other device. Uh, it's mostly used for the for debug, uh, and the useful thing it can do is it can set your uh, time inside the PHC from the system time uh, just in one go. Unlike the PHC to sys, which which basically runs the whole server and it takes quite some time to synchronize the timers. PHCCTL can just pull the system time and put it in your PHC and that's it. 
it's very useful when you, for example, initialize, like start your setup. Some drivers will not set the timer uh, to any reasonable time. So in that case, you will start in 1970. If you're not okay with that, you can use the PHCCTL to actually set it to, to what's your best available time when you do it. And also it can be useful for comparing time. It can, in a single shot, just uh, just try to get the time from system, get the time from PHC, and give you the difference between those. It is quite useful if you, if you try to debug. OK, so uh, the whole toolset comes with a great flexibility. Uh, you have, actually, in 1588, it's a superset. Uh, so it can run in multiple different profiles. I probably won't have time to introduce all of them. Uh, but basically, you have two main modes that it runs to. It's either the peer-to-peer -peer mode, which synchronizes uh, time to your closest uh, neighbor. And there is the end-to-end -end mode, which selects the grandmaster, which can be somewhere else in the network. And the packets will traverse all through the network to get to you with, with the time. Uh, then the next uh, possibilities are you can either choose the multicast mode or the unicast. In the multicast mode, the, the, uh, basically all you need is to run the PTP for a start and it will automatically find the, the, the master in the network. While in the unicast mode, you will need to give it the list of the masters to query, and then it will try to query the masters and, put, and find the best master based on that. Uh, it can run on the L2 or L3 traffic. It supports both IPv4 and IPv6. Uh, it implements boundary clocks and transparent clocks. And like I said, it can work in the PTP only mode, or it can also work alongside with the NTP. So a very short, I will probably skip most of the profiles because we don't really have time. Uh, but there is a main generic uh, profile, which is the default one set by the PTP4L. Uh, but we can also set uh, choose some telecom profiles. It supports variety of them. Uh, each of them are specialized for different uh, for dif different deployments. We can have a whole session about the profiles, so I won't be too deeply deep into them. Uh, there are also some industrial uh, profiles, uh, power network profiles, audio-video profiles. That's the TSN, which I know there will be some talks later about. Uh, there is a white rabbit, which is the 1588 on steroids. <laughs> It can try to also use the physical layer synchronization to get to picosecond level precision. It's developing CERN. And there is an automotive profile. And the enterprise, and there is also a data center profile. So basically, the 1588 is a super set of features which you can pick and choose from to match your deployment or whatever works for you best. Another important piece is the time scales. So PTP operates like in, there are two modes. It operates either in the PTP time scale, which is the same as TAI's time scale. So it's the atomic clock time scale. And if you don't like this, you can set it up in the arbitrary mode. So then it works in the arbitrary time scale. But then you're on your own, and you will need to give uh, correct corrections between the TAI and UTC inside your data set. Uh, so the system timer operates in UTC time, which is important because the UTC time uh, corrects for the leap seconds. We are currently uh, ahead by 37 seconds from the TAI. Uh, <coughs> so UTC includes those. And that uh, UTC to tie difference needs to be is encoded in leap files and needs to be, for example, provided uh, to the ts 2 phc somehow. Uh, because the GNSS receivers give you UTC time. So if you extract those, the UTC time from the NMEA messages, you need to correct. Uh, so you need to convert those, those into the TAI so that it matches the default PTP timescale. 
So now, how do you turn it on? So yeah, basically, this device is actually the something a bit different. It is the uh, GPS disciplined oscillator, which is a fun project to make if you like playing with time. Uh, okay, so basically, you first need to go through some preparations. You need to locate timing pins. So obviously, each network interface will have them set up differently. Then you need to set the, connect the one TPS signal from uh, output from your GNSS receiver to the input of the NIC. Then connect the UART so that you can get the NME8 messages and, and use them as, as the time source. Then obviously connect the antenna, that's always useful. And also it's useful if you know the limitations of your hardware because there are different for example, the first one applies to Raspberry Pi, where when you try to read the time from your from the PHC, it blocks the hardware timestamping, and there are, can be some challenges if you try to run the PHC to sys alongside the TS to PHC, for example. Uh, and only certain ways of timestamping can be available, uh, and you need to be aware how to set it up in the TS to PHC. So for the hardware requirements, you need the hardware that supports hardware timestamping. Otherwise, your precision won't be that great. Uh, yeah, like I said, exposed PPS input output for for if you want to dig deeper into it and, for example, measure the this, the offset the phase offset between the master and slave and the GNSS module plus the wires. Okay, so if you want to start the server with the GMSS module, uh, what you need to do, I hope the arrows will render here. So basically, uh, first thing you will start is the TS2PHC, which will get the time of day through the NMEA messages uh, from the GMSS, and will receive the one PPS timestamps of the signal that's physically connected to your network pins. So whenever the, the GNSS sends the one PPS, which is basically the raising edge of the of the signal that's timestamped by your network interface, then it gives you it gives the timestamp when this event happened to your PS2 PHC. And since we know that this is the one second zero nanoseconds, we can correct our PHC to actually match that. So that will happen by adjusting the frequency of the PHC so that we will, whenever the next PPS comes in, it will, it should get at the zero offset. <clears throat> and once that's up, we can start the PTP4L, which will basically use the transmit receive timestamps to send the time to your network. And if you want to also synchronize the system clock, you can also run the PHC to sys which will measure the offset between the system clock and the PHC uh, and adjust the frequency of the system clock and also adjust the time of the system. And there are the commands to run uh, to, to get this done. I won't read through them, it doesn't make much sense. So now the client setup on the other, on the other side of the network. Uh, if you have the need that's capable of timestamping, you will run the PTP4L, which will exchange the time the time through the and through the timestamps, like through the packets that will be timestamped. Uh, we'll try to adjust the frequency and set the times inside your PHC. And then you can as well use the PHC to sys to transfer the time to your system code. That's basically the setup wasn't that hard, I hope. <laughs> so now let's go to the uh, limitations, known issues, tricks, and other uh, useful things. We are over time a bit, but I hope we, yeah, can... we can... We can come to the other question. Mm -hmm. So the, you showed that output of this 4 h sys with a whole bunch of way back when you had like a table of... How do you know? If, and it was showing per path connection? Uh, yeah, it, could, it shows you the path delay between the master and, and slave I, But I could identify from the lines which path was which. Like, uh, that's the mm, path between the one nick and the other. 
That's basically the latency of your network. Right, but there were four entries or six entries. So uh, let's get back to that for a second. Yes, yeah. Uh, sorry, that's the PHC to sys, that's the PTP for that. No, 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 I was actually talking about the previous one. Uh, the PHC to sys? Yeah. Okay, so that's the different story. Uh, the PHC to sys uses the IOCTLs that what they do yeah. is they capture system time before reading the uh, time from your network, then they go over PCI bus, read the time, and... Uh, and right, right, so I, I got... But each of them, like how do I know which line is which path? Because uh, this is this is printed at the rate of uh, how often you pull the time from your from your uh, card and the system. Oh, this is one path. Yeah, that's this just just one one, one try. One path. Okay. okay. Yes. That's, that's a part of it. Mm -hmm. Got Got Okay, so let's get back to our superpowers. Yes. Sorry. Sorry to delay no the problem. Super, <laughs> okay, so the current release of Linux PTP uh, has some known issues. Uh, for example, the time of day from the NMEA support is a bit buggy. Uh, namely, the embedded leap second list expired because the leap second lists are released by the NIST. Uh, okay, we will get back to the bridge questions later, probably. Uh, but basically, the, the leap second lists have the expiry date. And since this time, it was the first time where, where we didn't introduce a new leap second because the Earth kind of slowed down, <laughs> probably during COVID. <laughs> uh, so, so basically, the leap second list expired while it's still valid. But as a consequence, you need to give it as the argument like specify the, the external leap second list and the bad thing is that this leap second while it's included in Debian based uh, in the format that's readable to the to the TS2 PHC but on like rel based they changed the format introduced their own I think it's kind of some some kind of NTP or something standard and basically you need to download it for directly from I, either IETF or NIST. Uh, yeah, in this release, the NMEA TTY speed, so the serial port speed, was fixed to 9600. Uh, you can't change it. It's patched in the in the main version, but but it, there was no release since 3.1. Uh, yeah, the the um, link speed mismatch will cause hidden time offset. That's a big thing if you if your client in your server runs on different speeds and you connect them through a switch that's not time hour uh, you will actually not even notice because the logs in the ptp 4 l will correct but if you use the physical layer uh, offsets so you set up one one side to receive timestamps and the other to output the pps to another device you will see that there is a mismatch like there is a offset fixed offset, which is caused by the link delay. And uh, yeah, the ts 2 phc assumes the utc 2 pi offset is correctly set inside the system, which is actually uh, not true if you don't, write a, don't run any NTP daemon, because this uh, ts 2 phc basically tries to use the system API to, to get the current utc 2 pi offset. But this offset is not set on boot, but it's set by the NTP daemon that's running. So basically, if you don't run any NTP daemon and you use the generic source of time, which is the system timer, you will actually get the times, timestamps and time scale inside the PTP in the UTC time scale and not in the time because the offset is not set. OK, now a couple of hints. Uh, like I mentioned, you can run a single uh, invocation of ts 2 phc for multiple adapters. So if you have a couple adapters that you try to sync the PHC to the timestamps, you can use a single time of day source, for example, parse single NMEA messages source and uh, use that time of day information to populate to multiple clocks. 
uh, you can specify different UDS sockets because by default uh, PTP4L uh, creates just one socket and overrides it when you when you start another PTP4L. But you can specify the UDS address manually, and in this case, you will be able to communicate to all the PTP4Ls that are running inside your system. Uh, yeah, and Linux PTP tools can long uh, can use long arguments. Uh, Sorry, long parameters just like as arguments. So you need to you can specify, for example, the dash dash UDS address and the long parameters. Uh, yeah, and you the, should really disable MTP when you run the PHC to sys and try to synchronize uh, the time on your system from the PTP because if you still have MTP running, then you will see some spurious jumps and, and strange things will happen because MTP will also try to set up the same time. And also a useful hint is that namespaces can be used to isolate different uh, instances. If you run the L3, L3 traffic, you can, for example, deploy a single box with multiple clients by using namespaces and uh, assigning ports to, to different namespaces This will isolate ports. Because if you are running on L2, it will use the row sockets, so this problem won't take this. Okay, so uh, for monitoring, you can use the TS2PHC in the free run mode. Uh, in this mode, it will not correct the time. It will just give you, print you the timestamps when they arrive. It can be useful for monitoring. Also, PTP4L can do that as well. Uh, the important part is when you use physical signals, you need to correct for the cable length because the speed of light is limited. So you, when you get to nanosecond precision, you actually find out that it's limited. Uh, so yeah, most cables, like the rule of thumb is six nanoseconds per meter of cable. Uh, and like I said, it's always you know good to verify the output of your system on the physical layer. Don't trust the prints of the tools because in some cases they will look great, but actually your, your time will not be correct. <laughs> okay, I'll skip probably for that, but this this show this uh, introduces two in, useful tools that can be used to expose your GMSS remotely. For example, if you want to uh, increase the precision by running real-time kinematic, uh, so that it will correct also for uh, physical phenomena like you know the. Uh, clouds on the sky and stuff like that. You can also expose the GMSS remotely, but we will probably put that to the uh, next episode. <clears throat> so what will happen next? Uh, in the next release, uh, we will have the ability to monitor multiple PHCs with phc 2 sys which will be very useful if you wants to deploy the synchronization of the system time to the, one of the PTP ports and then, for example, transfer it to other ports using physical layer and then monitor everything with just one tool. Uh, there will be added, the, uh, the free running mode will be added, so we will be able to use the PHC to, to monitor actually the, the precision, the offset between your system time and, and the time in your NIC. Uh, yeah, the important part is that the PTG minor version was upgraded recently, so this may break compatibility with old hardware. So if you upgrade to the mainline PT Linux PTP, you can actually see that some devices may not work as expected. Uh, it adds the virtual clock support, which is very interesting. Uh, implementation where, where your PHC, the hardware clock, is used as the source of uh, timestamps for multiple virtual overlays. So basically you overlay virtual clocks on your physical clock. Don't touch the frequency and phase on the physical clock, but only on the overlays. And uh, yeah, the dynamic tree rec reconfiguration to PHC was the, something that was also recently introduced. It can basically use the knowledge of the PTP4L. If you, if you have multiple NICs, for example, connected with physical signals, uh, you can have more than, uh, you can see how they are connected. 
uh, and then the ts 2 phc will automatically reconfigure uh, based on the out of the on the input from the ptp4l that the multiple ptp4l instances running for each port and then reconfigure the physical transfer so which one will be the source of pps and which one which ones will get the pps's from other devices dynamically based on the input from the ptp and it also adds the read-only UTS socket for monitoring. <coughs> and yeah, follow me for more recipes. <laughs> I will post something to this GitHub. It's currently empty because, well, planes were delayed and stuff happened. <laughs> so basically, I will I will uh, push some some recipes that are uh, useful for setting up the basic time master configuration and basic grandmaster configurations into that GitHub probably today, hopefully. And that's it. If you have any questions, feel free to ask. Yeah? When you say local network, uh, you also mentioned that you want to switch that to not uh, be aware. Mm -hmm. So what do you mean by the local network? Uh, it's a fluent definition of local network. Basically, when the, the local network means what's between your master and your slave. Uh, generally, I would say PTP is more like you know a smaller scale. It won't really scale up through the one because you don't have any control of the routing, and there are some packets that needs to be delivered on time. And since usually on one you won't have time stamping or, or like time hour notes, you won't even know what happened. So I would say it's more of a, you know, you need to scale down. Um, yep. So you mentioned in, in 4.0 that um, you're going to support multiple PHCs. Mm -hmm. um, so that's for the timing itself, or does it also allow um, having one port connected to a grandmaster and propagating the clock down to more devices like yes you can use that to propagate it down you need to be aware that if you use the phc to sys to propagate it down the precision won't be that great because you know you're running in the system so you get the delays on the pci and so on and so forth mm -hmm. uh, it can give some precision it's not terrible uh, but if you want to get better precision, it's better to go into this dynamic tree, uh, clock tree reconfiguration and use the physical signals. So then you connect the inputs of the PPS to the, out to the outputs, and basically you can use the TS2PHC and TTP4L to dynamically reconfigure everything you know, so that you, you get the PPSs from the best source. Yeah? So in the beginning, you mentioned that uh, uh, the Greater time precision can give you um, more performance on other databases. Mm -hmm. And right now you said that you have to scale down your network. So yes, but it doesn't mean that you cannot deploy um, different grandmasters that are synchronized to the GMSS okay. uh, in different data centers or different parts of data centers and so on. And also, you know, if you are inside the data center, you basically know what you deploy. So you can deploy the time hour nodes and then you can scale it up. So basically you can you can get the PTP across the data center. It's more complex if you go to the one, right? It's you know. Yeah, sure. Uh, but in this case, I mean in this case, uh, you probably need the kind of special availability and in Linux PTP, as far as I know, if you set up several ground masters and they will uh, give you the same block uh, accuracy and block plus mm -hmm. uh, all files will stick on only one gm uh, yes because well one will be the best and the best finally ultimately is the designated by this clock id so if everything else matches, they will all connect to a single node because the clock ID will matter. So it's up to you to set up the data sets so that you can actually you know, designate. Well, there are two ways. You can either use the multicast and designate, like, you know, try to somehow uh, box parts of your network, or you can use unicast and just tell you talk to this one, you talk to that one. Okay, and yeah, and in this case, uh, I believe that the network topology will matter a bit. 
uh, network topology. Network topology will always matter as long as you are crossing different, uh, not uh, timing aware nodes. If they are timing aware, well, it's it's hard to you. You would need to explain what you need by the, what you mean by the, by the topology. By the way, do we have a mic for a room? Because I'm I'm afraid people will not see the questions. Sorry. Oh, okay. Just repeat the question. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. So. So uh, the question actually is, uh, how can you measure the difference between several clients if they are connected to this to the same GM or even to the several GMs that are similar to the GNSS? Mm -hmm. uh, so how can you measure the difference? Basically, this this boils down to the PPS outputs, and. Uh, in the best scenario, you do you will just measure the physical signals, and that will that will give you the best uh, information. If you can't do that, you can also uh, use, for example, the TS to PHC and connect the physical PPSs between the nodes, and then, for example, capture the uh, in the free running mode, see how your clock is actually working against the real PPS and obviously you can you can once you deploy and you know that that the timestamp the reports from ptp 4 l are reliable uh, you can rely on that but that's like the uh, that's the question actually how can we check that that hardware time steps are reliable uh, so, yeah so basically you need to first try to to fall back to the physical method and once you get that and you can confirm that your network will actually work as expected, meaning you know, because the main the main uh, problems are the delay asymmetries or uh, or packet delay variations. Those are two main reasons why the timestamps are and and actually the reports will be incorrect. Yeah. Um, so have you ever thought about any kind of liner tests? Which test? Sorry. Liner security test. So. Uh, Prove that uh, clients in a, in, a, in a time going forward are always ahead. So uh, it's so. the problem is that that you, you know we we are getting into the territory of measuring the speed of light. You can only measure it like back and forth. You cannot measure one way speed of light, and it's the same problem because you cannot really measure the unless you do some fancy stuff where you basically deploy two nodes that are GNSS synchronized and then you can measure the one-way delay. But if you try to have the, the slave port somewhere in the network that does not have the PPS physical signal, it doesn't have any matter of, of measuring whether its timestamps will be correct or not. That's basically the physical problem. Yeah, but I believe if you don't, Yes, but there are there are like methods of proving it. You can, for example, set up a couple grandmasters and the, verify the synchronization between them. Then you have so, the reference from the GNSS, for example, and then you can measure the whether whether the timestamps are correct. Uh, it can support because it can run in the free run mode. You can run, you know, the. It will show uh, offsets for several GMs in this case. Uh, can it give you. Um, it's I don't the only thing that we need actually in, in such kind of tests. So yeah, but know. but you know this is this is something that you need mostly for the initial deployment. Like you need to understand what happens, and in that case, you can basically, for example, switch between the grandmasters. Yeah, that's true. But in case of data center networks, for example, in closed networks, the topology can change dynamically. Mm -hmm. and you cannot see. Yes, well, there is some pre-work that you need to do. Like you, you need to make sure that that uh, your network will actually either you will use like. Uh, unroutable protocols somehow that will always go through like L2 traffic that will always go through a certain path 
or you need to make sure that it will route. But also, again, you know, if you route through the through the time hour uh, nodes, so the either boundary clock or the transparent clock, this problem goes away because they can give you correct for the residence time or, or basically serve the time downstream. You might want a boundary clock, but for transparent clock, uh, actually the, the difference will be uh, diff the, the difference between clients and the uh, muscles uh, will differ because of asymmetry of physical networks. Uh, but that's what transparent clock will try to correct for. No, transparent clock will not correct physical connections. I mean, yeah, if it if the packet goes one way too and the other way, then yeah, exactly. yes, then exactly. So mm -hmm. It's a normal situation in close networks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but that's why you're supposed to have each pop aware of the 1588 mechanism. Like the original design of 1588 was to only have it on one physical link. There were never supposed to be switches in between. And as uh, if you have it on one physical port, the characteristics are determined by whatever cable you have there. And the cable can be asymmetric, but it's going to be a one-time thing that you have to figure out, and then it's not going to change anymore. All these problems of of changing characteristics. That most of them you can eliminate if your switches are 1588 aware and terminate the link on, on, on the switch for the time and then create a new link and uh, that way you get the compensation mechanism in so there. The boundary mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, actually there is a lot of talks in if you are interested on the OCP tab group, which is the basically the group that tries to pull, push that into the data centers and, and so on. You can refer to there. There are there are some talks that talk, talk about those. Okay, thanks. We're out of time. So, I mean, if there's, a, if there's people who want to sit around and talk, yeah. obviously stay here. Uh, you don't miss lunch. I see the lunch <laughs> already out there. Come on, you broke the thing. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but um, we could, I mean, lunch is box, so you can take it and bring it back. Oh, no, you can't come back in here because you can't get food here. So yeah. you can either talk or eat. No, <laughs> <laughs> so see you around. <laughs> Thank you. Everybody. Yeah, thanks a lot. I didn't expect so many people here. <laughs>